All righty. Let's let folks join. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I'll be kicking us off today. Uh, hello, my name is Shailen Jotishi. I'm the CEO of the Journal of Science, Policy, and Governance and a senior analyst at the think tank New America in Washington, DC. For those of you who are new to JSPG for 10 years, we've been the international open access outlet for students, policy fellows, postdocs, and early career researchers to substantively contribute their ideas to every imaginable dimension of science, technology, and innovation policy or management debate, ranging from how to address space debris to new models for pioneering climate action. Through strategic partnerships, like with our friends at AAAS and the United Nations, NSPN, the UK Science and Innovation Network, and many other national and international sector leadership groups, our mission is to publish, nurture, and help elevate next generation voices in science and technology policy. This event marks the third of a six part series, an expert dialogue series co hosted by JSPG and AAAS. The series coincides with our latest call for papers, which is generously supported by the Coffley Foundation. JSPG and AAAS invites early career scientists, engineers, and policy professionals of all walks of life to submit policy position papers covering a myriad of topics that would help us shape a better future of American science and science policy. This call for papers celebrates the 75 year anniversary of Vannevar Bush's seminal text, Science the Endless Frontier, which set the stage of much of US science policy to date. Each of our six expert dialogues will help authors get a better sense of where they might focus their writing with an eye towards key focal areas connecting back to Endless Frontier. All recordings will be posted on our YouTube channel, which I hope you'll follow. We invite ambitious, bold, innovative, and entrepreneurial ideas tackling the nation's most urgent science policy problems. The deadline to submit is April 4th, and you can learn more at sciencepolicyjournal.org. Don't miss out on any opportunities. Follow JSPG on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We also have a monthly newsletter for special opportunities and ways to participate. All links will be dropped in the chat momentarily. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact myself or a member of our JSPG team, Joanne Lee and Adriana Bankston. Without Joanne and Adriana, we would not be gathered here today. So much gratitude to the both of you. Today, we have an amazing panel to shed light on how we can enhance undergraduate and graduate STEM education in the United States. These speakers are so illustrious that their CVs alone would fill a volume of JSPG. So I will briefly introduce the stellar lineup before introducing, uh, turning it over to our moderator. While I do that, please follow them and their organizations on Twitter. Tweet us, tweet at us, share your thoughts, share your ideas. We'll be amplifying you throughout the session and those who tweet the most will be invited to contribute to a special JSPG blog feature at the conclusion of our dialogue series. And that goes for all of our dialogue series. So join us for the next couple of Fridays. Pull up your browser tabs and phones and share your reflections with us. First up is our moderator, Kate Stoll, Senior Policy Advisor at MIT's Washington office, where she reps MIT around a variety of science policy topics. Kate was previously a ACS Congressional Fellow on Capitol Hill and a AAAS Fellow at NSF, where she worked on STEM education. Kate helped create NSF Innovation in Graduate Education Challenge and also serves on the Board of Higher Education and the Workforce at the National Academies and a number of AAAS centers and groups and other advisory committees. Kate, thanks so much for joining us. Shirley Tillman is President Emerita of Princeton University, recognized as Discover Magazine as one of the 50 most important women in science. President Tillman was the first woman to lead Princeton and the second female president in the Ivy League. She's a member of virtually every major honorary society and has led many, many projects with the National Academies and other groups focused on STEM education innovation. 
Shirley Malcolm is the head of education and human resources programs at AAAS, where she's led a number of efforts for decades. Dr. Malcolm was previously a program officer in the Science Education Directorate at the National Science Foundation. She was a faculty member and she taught high school science for two years. If you're jealous of her science, her, her students, that makes two of us. Dr. Malcolm has also led a number of high profile efforts at the American Academy, the National Academies, the Carnegie Corporation, and the list goes on. She served on the White House PCAS under President Clinton and the National Science Foundation's National Science Board, the governance group for NSF. And last but not least, Lane Shear is a senior program officer at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, another one of our JSPG partners, where she's directed many of the most important American STEM ed studies in the 21st century, focus on mental health, substance abuse, well-being in higher ed, undergraduate STEM education, systemic change, teacher preparation, graduate education, diversity, equity, inclusion, and the list goes on. Lane was previously at the NSF Education and Human Resources Directorate. Thank you all for joining us, panel. We're honored and excited to learn along with you. We'll be turning things over to Kate now to take it from here. We'll have a discussion with the panel for about 30 minutes or so, followed by an audience Q&A for 20 minutes. Please share your reactions and questions in the chat. The JSPG team will be monitoring and sharing with the moderator. Live tweet. Uh, we, again, the person who tweets the most will be invited to contribute to a JSPG blog at the conclusion of our series. And again, join us for the next couple of Fridays as we carry on this discussion. Kate, thanks so much for moderating. Please take it away. Thank you, Shalyn. I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here today and to moderate this very esteemed panel with undoubtedly wonderful ideas to get you all inspired. So. Today, we're here to talk about undergrad and graduate STEM education, starting with a look back at what Vannevar Bush's Endless Frontier Report says on the subject. We will also consider longstanding challenges in undergraduate and graduate STEM education, and then explore ideas and solutions for the future. In the seminal 1945 report, Science, the Endless Frontier, Vannevar Bush dedicated a chapter to scientific talent. In the report, Bush wrote, there are talented individuals in every segment of the population, but with few exceptions, those without the means of buying higher education go without it. Here is a tremendous waste of the greatest resource of a nation, the intelligence of its citizens. There are few topics in science policy with greater significance for the future than STEM education. Bush focused on education as a means to produce people who could conduct research. As stated in the report, the future of science in this country will be determined by our basic educational policy. That was true 75 years ago, and I would argue that remains true today. But a lot has changed in the past 75 years. We've made great progress in research and access to education since 1945. But some of the models that were established back then are still echoing today in ways that exclude people from a career in science. Later in this chapter, Bush noted that to get top scientific leadership, there must be a relatively large base of high ability selected for development, and then successive skimmings of the cream of ability at successive times and at higher levels. Today, we know that some such skimmings, as Bush put it, both intentional and unintentional, result in a relatively homogeneous group, limiting the full pool of talent in STEM. So that leads to a few questions. Where are the opportunities for progress and innovation in STEM education? How can we fully cultivate the talent of a broad and diverse population of America? How can we be more welcoming of the talent that international students bring to this country? And how can we better support all students on their STEM education pathway so that we develop the greatest resource of a nation, as Bush phrased it? The panelists today will discuss what is and is not working in US undergraduate and graduate STEM education, including for whom it is and whom it is not working. 
They will also lay out a few ideas for a modernized system that fully embraces and supports all STEM interested students so that the potential of this nation's diverse talent is fully realized. And then it's up to you in the audience to expand on those ideas, add your own, and submit them to the journal. If there's one thing I've learned in my time working on national graduate education policy, is that including students and early career voices in the dialogue is essential. Lane's nodding her head. <laughs> the JSPG call for papers is your chance to contribute to this conversation, and I hope you do. So with that table setting, I wanna turn it over to our esteemed panelists who will present a few ideas to get you going on your own policy proposals. So Shirley Tillman, I'd like to start with you today. It's well known that introductory science classes at the college level can be used to weed out students rather than stimulate and grow students' interests and knowledge in science and engineering. This is just one of the hurdles students face in college on the path to a career in STEM. Would you tell us about the major barriers faced by students as they embark on an undergraduate education and share some thoughts on how to create better, a better environment for students to thrive? Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, talk about this briefly um, uh, and focus on undergraduate education. So uh, uh, Vannevar Bush used that terrible phrase, let's skim. He began with the, the very good uh, objective of having the top of the funnel be as broad as possible. But the problem that often happens early in undergraduate STEM education is that the skimming happens quickly and it happens quite disproportionately. So many, uh, and for many years, this is not a new problem. This is a problem that's been around from the very beginning, that many of the introductory courses that are specifically designed to prepare students to concentrate in that discipline really have as an unspoken agenda, the notion of weeding out all but the most fit. It's a, it's a very Darwinian uh, system. Uh, and the consequence is that those individuals who arrive at college or university who are deeply committed to the idea of pursuing a career in science, but have not had a strong preparation in their high schools are almost immediately uh, weeded out. And once you're weeded out of one of those introductory courses that are specifically designed to get you ready to be a major, there's almost no path back into the major. So what many colleges indeed do is have um, uh, introductory courses that are intended to be for non-majors, but those courses do not prepare you to get back on the science track. In fact, they really uh, send you off on a siding uh, from which uh, the likelihood that you will be a future scientist is very dim indeed. So what to do about this? So I'd like to um, just suggest one idea that has already been tested and proven to work at Carnegie Mellon. And this happened maybe 10 or 15 years ago when Carnegie Mellon recognized that they were seeing uh, very few women uh, opting to concentrate in computer science. And when they looked into the reason, it ended up being entirely due to the preparation difference between boys and girls as they proceed through adolescence. Uh, the boys who were concentrating in, in computer science at Carnegie Mellon had all been programming in their bedrooms with the, the shades drawn since they were 11 years old. So by the time they got to Carnegie Mellon, they were off and running. Uh, that is not the way our society socializes girls. And so very few of them had had that kind of deep computer science experience. And so when they hit their first computer science class, they realized that there was no way that they could possibly keep up with the boys who had had a very different experience in high school. So rather than just sort of giving up and saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it. This is a problem that happens before college and that's not our problem. Carnegie Mellon did something really smart, which is they created a whole path through both the freshman and the sophomore year that was directed specifically for students who had not had computer science experience uh, prior to, to college. But, and most importantly, 
the intent of the curriculum for those first two years was to get whoever was in those courses ready to join the major by junior year. And it worked brilliantly to the point that uh, once this curriculum was in full force, computer science at um, Carnegie Mellon was, was seeing dramatic ex uh, expansions in the number of women. So I think if we ha have to acknowledge that students come in with very different backgrounds and very different preparations, and there is not one size that fits all, and colleges need to be thinking about ways in which they can um, prepare those students who will be perfectly um, successful in science. They just haven't had the right preparation until they get to college. So I might mention just one other issue that I think is equally important, which is, um, I'm going to say this about this generation, but I, I actually think what I'm about to say has been true for many generations, which is why do you want to become a scientist in the first place? For the most part, it is not to, to uh, do deep theoretical work, but it is to use your education to solve societal problems, to understand why you do science and how you do science not just the facts and figures and theorems and hypotheses, but, but how to apply those to, um, to your uh, learning of science. Um, and I'll, I'll give you, I, I like solutions to problems that I raise, so I'm going to give you a solution that we found at Princeton. One of the things we noticed was that we, after the first year of engineering, we were losing uh, largely people of color and we were losing women from the major, uh, majoring in, in engineering. And when we looked into the cause of that, one of the things that became very clear is that many of the students who dropped out said, it just didn't make sense. We, we signed up to be an engineer, but we were sent off to study math and physics. We had no idea how that was relevant to engineering. It was a mystery to us. So we completely revamped the, the freshman curriculum in engineering so that it was taught by engineers. It, they learned the same physics, they learned the same mathematics, but they were learning it within the context of solving engineering problems. And again, just as the story with Carnegie Mellon, we saw that there was a real jump in the retention of underrepresented minorities and women in engineering because they were learning the discipline of engineering within the context of the kinds of motivations that got them to thinking they wanted to be an engineer in the first place. So I think those are two areas where if we paid more attention to these two areas, how to improve preparation and how to make our science relevant to the world that students live in, I think we would see very substantial changes in who decides they want to continue to be educated, to be a scientist. Thank you, Shirley. I really like those two inspiring examples, and I think they will inspire additional uh, solutions and ideas from the audience. So thanks for that. I'm going to turn to Lane now. So Lane, uh, graduate STEM education is an, a whole other experience, right, with its own challenges and opportunities. If I could pull out a unifying theme of your work on graduate STEM education and student mental health, it would be centering education on the student. Um, so can you talk about approaches that put students' needs at the center of STEM education and where you see opportunities for improvement? Thanks, Kate. It is uh, an honor to be here speaking with you. And I think in thinking about the timeline of graduate STEM education, one of the things that I got to do when I first came to the National Academies is a look at a previous report on graduate STEM education written in 1995. We had a charge from the National Science Foundation at that time to look at what was working in graduate STEM education, who was getting degrees, what were the programs. And as I read that report almost 20 years later, it really signified that not a lot had changed there were still challenges in terms of uh, the inequity in who was earning degrees across all disciplines, both racial um, and ethnic groups and gender. There were concerns about mentoring and how students were receiving the 
proper guidance in order to fulfill their professional and educational goals. And there was some confusion on what really constituted the heart of a doctoral or a master's degree. And at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, we convened a committee of um, a really diverse range of individuals from um, people who had led colleges and universities to people who were earlier in their careers that had really dedicated themselves to thinking about graduate STEM education, not in terms of how it supports a system of research, but out of that report, really thinking about what does it mean to have a student-centered graduate education system? And pulling back from that, I think the key word there is system. And to think about where were the drivers, the incentives, and the accountability measures that really affect how students learn. If we look at uh, how principal investigators conduct their research, how grants are organized, students aren't necessarily at the forefront of how these things are organized. Big research universities can bring in a number of students and not necessarily always the hope that they're paying attention to the mission of education. But at the end of it, there isn't a necessarily an accountability measure that ensures that students are getting the skills and the development that they need to achieve their educational and professional goals. In terms of careers, we've known for many, many decades that most students that earn doctoral degrees won't go on to tenure track faculty positions. Some people, um, the positions aren't available, depends on the field um, in terms of availability. But a number of students increasingly, and I think Dr. Tillman really hit this nail on the head, really want to be looking beyond sort of what has naturally been research careers. Where can science have a greater impact in society? And that can be through policy, um, there are wonderful examples with the AAAS Science and Technology um, Fellowships, um, the Christine Berzion Fellowship at the National Academies, um, but law, um, you know, state and local governments, um, the growing tech sector. There are a number of ways that individuals might not be actively working in research environments where they are contributing very important um, con contributions to society and the ethics around how we're applying the scientific research that comes out of the research universities themselves. So in this report, one of the things that we really tried to peel back and do is to start at square one. Uh, Dr. Alan Leshner, who has previously been at AAAS, um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Mental Health, he really had the committee think about if we were to start from square one, what sort of skills would be really at the heart of all doctoral and master's education. And throughout the process, there were a number of conversations that we had around what is the, the core and what is the real ambition behind these programs. And one of the things that came up was sort of the, the mix between research-oriented skills and professional skills. Others might call them soft skills or non-academic skills. But over the course of the conversations that we had, the research that we looked at in terms of what was valued in the workforce, what did students want to get out of their education, and what they were actually learning, that breakdown became a lot fuzzier. For students looking at you know, tenure track professions, looking at policy, project management, budgeting, communications, they're all critical parts of what make people successful in their jobs. For managing a grant, for being able to communicate to a funder, to be able to work within a university, a lot of these skills that had often been considered non-academic, they were actually really at the heart of both sides of um, sort of the divide, which is a false divide between these academic and non-academic careers. And some of the programs that we looked at that I think really were able to position the student at the heart of, of, the, of the department um, I'll use, for example, the University of Michigan's chemistry program. Throughout the, their learning, the students are able to come in, they take their coursework, but as they're looking at labs to work with, they're not committed to a single lab from the beginning. They're allowed to rotate and they're mandated to rotate through a series of different labs to be able to get exposure to different work styles, which is critical, different mentoring styles. We know mentoring is such an incredibly important part 
of doctoral education, and then they can make their decision after they've had that range of exposure. That mentorship component is also another piece that I'll touch on in a minute, but the ability for students who are coming in out of undergraduate, who are really driven by the, the science and the research and the questions, the curiosity that they have around the issues, might not have had the experience and the opportunity yet to make decisions around what work style works best for them in their research. What questions might come up for them about who they want to be working with, what continues to drive them as they're thinking about their dissertation. And I think that model, which you know, doesn't necessarily put the uh, you know, principal investigators and the faculty have to work with different rotations of students, they have to be prepared to introduce them to the, the workings of the lab, but it allows students to have the opportunity to get what they need out of the education in a very systematic format. And they've seen over the years, time to degree has gone down. They have had less um, issues in terms of conflicts with mentors and mentees, and they've been able to increase their graduation rate. And so I think that as a model can really shape um, or really put a spotlight on where decisions can help align the system of education and sort of how the curriculum and how a student moves from point A to point B um, with less friction and more freedom for students to explore. Um, we, I mentioned mentorship in the beginning and one of the other uh, reports that came out from the National Academies was looking at the science of effective mentorship in STEM. That was led by Maria Lundahlberg, a fantastic colleague, and they actually have a podcast out if you're interested in hearing more about the, the stories and the evidence base around um, effective mentorship. But one of the things that came into play with that report was thinking about the models of mentorship that can really support students. From the apprenticeship model in which a student is working with an individual um, principal investigator who serves as the mentor, a lot of students, it puts a lot of pressure. It creates a big power differential as the student has to depend a great deal on their single mentor for all sorts of career advice, professional development, which can be sort of the formal research setting. But also if we're thinking about conduct at conferences, how to navigate professional situations, there's a lot of other sort of informal training that happens in a doctoral education or a master's education for, for what it's worth. And the, both in the graduate education report and in this mentorship report, there was a greater emphasis on departments building avenues and structures for students to get multiple mentors, to develop a network of mentors in order for students to have the opportunity to learn from different people. Um, I think in a similar way, any relationship um, that one has, it puts a lot of pressure if there's just one person to turn to. But if there's opportunities with alumni opened up, other members of faculty, with peers or near peers, so a graduate student to a postdoc, there can be other venues for students to understand, what are my career opportunities? That way, a principal investigator, a tenure track faculty member who really understands academia, but might not know about other opportunities, doesn't have to be the sole person providing that information. Um, having alumni come in from industry and other, um, other sectors also gives students the opportunity to have exposure to other careers, to follow up with things that might be of interest, and to learn how to make decisions on how to you know, develop those professional networks outside of that one-on-one -on -one research relationship. And so I think between opening up the mentorship component, which also I think frees the student up in terms of learning how to, um, how to model their behavior. In terms of mental health, one of the things that we saw really strongly come out was students really look to their mentors to understand how to function in terms of their work-life balance, what opportunities might be available to them. And in terms of building that, that identity as a scientist, a lot of students can make that decision of, is this career right for me? Based on what they're seeing their mentors do. And so I think in terms of, um, we've seen women and um, individuals from historically marginalized races, ethnic groups, leave, at, leave academia at a higher rate. And it might be, and a lot of the research shows that the demands of a tenure track faculty position often don't feel like they're in alignment with the, the 
broader life goals that an individual might have. And so to the extent that the modeling that PIs can do for their mentees can really sort of expand on, you know, healthy boundaries, taking vacations, being able to set reasonable boundaries, good communication, even the mental health component for students can be improved by alleviating the stress of um, any challenges that might arise or friction that might arise with a mentor relationship and elevating that, you know, the degree to which departments can offer opportunities for students to, um, you know, learn about different career opportunities, to be able to learn healthy manage time management skills. Some of these things might feel like they're fairly basic or that maybe they don't, aren't the responsibility at the graduate level for um, a department or for a graduate um, school to attend to. But for first generation students, for students who uh, might not understand sort of the, the nature, the cycle, the demands of graduate school, making the things that we have always assumed were implicit in a degree, making them explicit and helping people have the skills to do that can alleviate some of the challenges that students might feel in terms of belonging, in terms of understanding you know, how the whole system works it can alleviate some of that and increase a sense of well-being and belonging for students. And so I think in terms of bringing it back to that student-centered um, education, the graduate school really has the opportunity to make all students feel welcome by, uh, by changing and shifting some of the things that we've always sort of taken as status quo. This dyadic relationship between mentors and mentees, the you know, sort of belief of you know, what a career looks like. And then even in terms of sort of how students are introduced and brought through their education, what things can we make sure um, students get a chance to understand so that they feel like they have that sense of belonging. They're more likely to stay if they feel welcome. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it back over to Kate for um, our next set of comments. Thank you, Lane. Very helpful encapsulation of, of all the different um, issues in grad ed and mental health for mental health resources for students. So thank you. I want to turn to Shirley Malcolm now. So Shirley, at every level of STEM education, from certificates and two-year degrees, all the way through PhDs and postdoctoral training, women and students of color face additional hurdles, including institutional racism and sexism that hinder them for full, partici full participation in the STEM workforce. Would you share with us your thoughts on the changes that need to take place at educational institutions and funding agencies for real progress on this front? And you're still muted, there we go. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was trying not to be heard when I was not supposed to be speaking. So uh, I'm really pleased to join this panel and I hope that what I have to say really kind of complements what you've already heard from Shirley and Lane because uh, as they have laid out the issues at the undergraduate or the graduate level, <clears throat> uh, I was thinking across any of those levels what we have is really a kind of a failure to include everyone. Uh, even though Van Ever Bush might have said in every segment of the population, uh, you have this talent, uh, not all the institutions were basically ready to take advantage of the talent that you have and to actually support the development of this talent. Um, I don't think that, I think that some of the things that if Bush were here today, he would recognize. I think he would recognize and appreciate the fact that <clears throat> according to his vision, that research has basically been situated in institutions of higher education. So that that could go on at the same time as education. But I don't really think that he would recognize the people who are in that pool of people to move forward. Uh, it's much more female, 57% of those in higher education are. And if you add to that, uh, the, uh, the uh, males, uh, people of color, males of color, uh, you're kind of like in a situation where about two thirds of the folks are not necessarily the folks that he would have seen when he was thinking about who was supposed to go there. And they're in different places than he probably imagined. Uh, 
Black and Latinx students are heavily in our two-year institutions. And yet we don't always see our two-year institutions as providing a pathway uh, into careers in science and engineering. And yet, if we don't really take advantage of that, uh, we are always going to be short with regard to having the diversity that, that we really need. Um, the two-year institutions, uh, for example, that you mentioned, they, are, they provide different kinds of access models. Uh, you get everything from certificates and two-year degrees that lead to transfer to four-year programs uh, to everything in between. People going to take a course that relates to the business that's down the road. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility there, and you would hope that people would be able to take advantage of that flexibility to incorporate whatever kind of career trajectory that they choose to. Uh, but it's a real challenge because, um, you, first of all, you have to know those opportunities are there. And those institutions often take students who are or may not be as well prepared as those who are able to enter for your institutions directly. Either they didn't think about it, the students when they were in high school about what they might want to do, or they had, um, they were in neighborhoods where the schools were not where the quality of the schools were not as high. And so the opportunities to explore the poss these possibilities just were not there. It's also true that um, there are, <clears throat> there's differential enrollment in for-profit institutions, which have their own challenges <clears throat> with regard to completing, to having women and minority students actually complete them. But at every step, <clears throat> and in some fields, more than in other fields, we have this, this under-participation as students, as undergraduate students, as graduate students, and as faculty, and as postdocs. So the, the, the pathways are not there in order to really bring about the opportunity to take advantage of the diversity that we really need to in order to support the creativity and innovation uh, that, that we all wish we had. So the changing nature of work means that the, the STEM pipeline, quote unquote, or the STEM workforce, whatever that happens to be, uh, is a lot bigger than we even think about. There are fields that are not necessarily thought of as STEM fields, but, in, but require incredible amounts of preparation within STEM before they can participate in those fields. And we don't tend to think about the health and allied health fields necessarily as being STEM fields, but you don't get to those, to those careers without going through an awful lot of math and science. And so it's a lot bigger kind of an enterprise that, that we have, and we need to be able to imagine how to help people navigate those so that they can end up in the places where they want to be. There are all kinds of challenges that are that accompany the the lack of diversity, or that are really a causal for it. Uh, it relates in part to not being able to gain the opportunities. It relates to uh, challenges with regard to funding, uh, to being able to uh, complete degrees in a timely way, to be able to uh, know as as surely so beautifully pointed out, what is the connection between what I'm studying and what it is that I want to do. And so all of these things really come together to, I think, depress the numbers. So, but, you know, there's good news out there too. And that is that we know a lot about keeping people in. We have learned a lot about how to keep people in. Uh, in some cases, they relate to the things that are as quote unquote simple as helping people understand the connections between the science or the mathematics that they're studying at the time and the problems that they sought to solve that brought them into the field in the first place. The other case, we know how not to have courses weed people out. Uh, we understand that active learning uh, it, it provides different kinds of strategies uh, to support uh, work in teams and work as peers, 
to uh, we understand the relationship between things like poor course design and poor levels of expectation that have been articulated to the, uh, to the students, either the expectations for learning or the expectations for their careers and the need for this. And so we also see a lot of, of uh, programs such as uh, student-led groups, for example, student chapters of SACNAS or student uh, or the National Society of Black Engineers, NSBE, and how those uh, those kinds of organizations provide a home, provide a, uh, a, a the opportunity for interaction that can support these students' career goals. So we know a lot about what has to happen with regard to repairing the kind of individual pieces. But I believe that the real challenge is that the systems themselves don't work. And that is one of the reasons that we have uh, stood up a program at AAAS called Sea Change, STEM Equity Achievement Change, that is uh, modeled in part from the Athena Swan program in the UK and the Race uh, Equality Charter within the UK. And looking to have institutions really ask themselves deep questions about how whether their pol policies, programs, and practices, their procedures, their traditions, their culture, actually support the kind of diversity and inclusion that we've been, that we're talking about. And in many cases, they don't. They were built for a different in a different era for a different group of students, the students that Bush did not see uh, if he had gone into the the classrooms and labs and so i think that uh it is time for us to think much more systemically much bigger in our visioning to talk about how we might bring players uh into the stem fields uh, who are really underrepresented uh, in those fields at present and that is a perfect call to action for all of the all the folks in the audience thinking about ideas. So thank you, Shirley. That was wonderful. So I want to open it up to the audience for questions. I see they're they're coming in. So keep putting them in the chat and we'll try to get through as many as we can. I'm going to start with a question from Brian, which is, and this can go to, to any of the three panelists because I know all three of you have put in a lot of thought about graduate education. So uh, it doesn't have to just be Lane that talks about grad ed, of course. So what are some scalable ideas for reworking graduate committees to better align with a student's career development goals rather than research goals or in addition to research goals? So are there ways that we go ahead, Lane? <laughs> no, I oh. think Shirley's ready. Shirley Tilden's ready to go. Uh, uh, it, it sure, it's Shirley T. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Lane has already uh, alluded to some of the things that I think would make a big difference. One, one is to broaden the number of individuals in a graduate program who feel some responsibility for the welfare of that student. So I think this, this began um, many years ago when, when many departments began adopting graduate committees. Um, that helped because there were more faculty members who were paying attention to the well-being of that student. Um, it, it expanded when uh, graduate committees began meeting without the advisor, sort of having an executive session, which allowed the uh, student to um, to be more frank uh, about some of the issues that they might be facing and trying to pursue their career um, opportunities. But, but at the end of the day, students are looking for signals. Um, you know, I, I've been talking about the, the importance of diversifying um, uh, prospective careers for graduate students for many, many years. The students are, have totally embraced this, at least in my own field, which is biomedical science, that the, the group that hasn't are the faculty. 
And so when you get together with a group of graduate students, what they will often tell you in a closed room is I don't dare tell my faculty that I actually don't want to do research. I want to do policy or I want to do science writing because then that my faculty member will not take me seriously. And this is it's horrifying to think that that is still happening in 2021, but you hear it all the time. So, so the only way to get around this is to have members of the faculty who are the most visible and respected by the graduate students to be saying at every possible opportunity, uh, we are here preparing you for as many career options as exist in the universe. And, and to say that a PhD is a degree that can be beneficial in so many different professions, but it has to be said, it has to be said convincingly, and it has to be said by the people who not only the students respect, but the faculty respect, because that is the only way it's gonna change. Amen. I have given the presentation, what can you do with a PhD? And the answer, the slide answer is anything you want. Uh, but you know, we know that, but getting the faculty to say it is absolutely critically important. And I, I don't understand uh, what is with this obsession with cloning oneself, you know? And I, but I do think that, that we have to be more uh, ask the faculty to be more intentional about the skill sets that the students are able to acquire uh, while they are in graduate education, uh, communication. In some cases, the, even the, the students want to teach, but they want to teach in a two-year institution. And they're not going to be very good at that unless they've had the opportunity to learn some of the skills and some of the pedagogical uh, constructs that they're going to need in order to be successful uh, in those kinds of, of places. But the other part is that our professional societies can give opportunities as well. I, I for many years when I uh, was running the Education Human Resources Committee, uh, it, it directorate, excuse me, at AAAS, uh, we had, well, were the home of something called the Mass Media Science and Engineering Fellows Program, okay? And that took students who are graduate students for the most part, some took in some cases postdoc, and gave them an opportunity to, uh, to write about science and technology, to be journalists. Basically, we threw them in the deep end of the pool and threw them off into media uh, sites across the, the country. And we have some really quite interesting alums. Uh, among our alums from the Mass Media Science and Engineering Fellows Program, is Eric Lander, who was just named the president's science advisor at cabinet rank. And I cannot help but believe that the communication skills that he acquired and the ability to interact with the media that he acquired in those kinds of settings, essentially, he's not going to throw that away. That's going to be critical in terms of the work that he's doing now and in terms of the work that he's done in the past. And I can give example after example where people did something else and acquired other skills that are absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I'll add to that is I think through technology, there are a number of other opportunities to get a sense of what careers are available, what sort of skills, um, in addition to professional societies. Um, I think the National Science Policy Network has been doing some really great work to elevate other opportunities. I think there are um, a lot of Twitter accounts. Um, the hashtag Black and STEM, I think, has um, offered up a lot of um, sort of support and resources for people who are going through their PhD or thinking about their careers. And I encourage people to be creative. Um, reach out to people who um, you think are doing good work on LinkedIn, um, just over email, and see if you can have a conversation about um, how they've gotten there. I, from what I've learned in policy, everyone comes at it from a different angle, and um, you can forge your own path. And so I think that idea of what can you do with a PhD um, is anything is good, and you have to forge that path on your own most of the time. And so it takes a little bit of, that freedom comes with a lot of um, sort of, uh, you need to just kind of go into the forest and carve your own path for yourself. That's a great point, Lane. And as you say, there are more and more opportunities 
for students to find those connected paths with others who have similar interests than there than there have ever been. So I want to keep pulling on this thread a little bit because we have several questions about internships as another way to get exposure to these other careers outside of academia. So some of the questions are in here. And I also want to point out Reba's note in the chat that the NSF has been doing more internships for NSF funded uh, grad students. So check that out. So a couple of questions are, what are some policy levers to scale more internship opportunities for grad students? And do you have examples of programs that have successfully incorporated internships into their PhD programs that we can use as models? So uh, maybe I'll start and get the ball rolling and um, I'm sure uh, my panelists will have other things to say as well. Um, internships, I think, can be really valuable. Um, but the issue with internships is always going to be timing. When is the best time to, to um, have an internship? Uh, from your faculty um, uh, mentor perspective, it is not in the middle of your graduate work uh, because often projects just simply can't be dropped and picked up again. If they can, then the middle works fine. But I can tell you in molecular biology, it does not work very well. So UCSF, the University of California at San Francisco, has um, adopted a lot of really good, I think, best practices about introducing students to other opportunities by putting inter internships basically toward the very, very end of your graduate career. I think that is the right time to do it, uh, primarily because um, you know a lot more and you're going to be able to take away more from those internships. But it also can come at a time when you're basically writing up your thesis. You're not having to be in the lab at four in the morning um, uh, uh, in, in the way that you would be, say, smack in the middle of your thesis. So I think there are institutions that are really uh, beginning to um, embrace the idea of using the end of the PhD. But if I could just make one sort of point about this. One of the reasons this is such a difficult issue is because of the relationship between the student and the faculty member is one related to the conduct of research, of, of productivity. And it is in the interest of the faculty to have you in the lab working as hard as possible for as long as possible. Let's just be honest. And so whatever programs get designed have to confront the fact that they are going, there's going to be resistance from faculty who would rather see you in the lab than seeing you going off to a six month internship in industry. And, and it's the challenge of developing good, good policies around this. Yes, I, th I think you're right. Uh, but there are some opportunities that pop up who, with faculty who are more entrepreneurial. For example, bringing the students into their startups, yeah. bringing to getting, so you're introducing them to a totally different model, but in the context of the faculty's work. Uh, the other part too, is I think that alumni can be really uh, uh, helpful as well. Many of the people who might have been in that faculty member's lab are now working in some other kind of a place, but those relationships have been maintained. And so being able to um, kind of explore what that looks like in a, I would say safe place. I think that it, it, to a certain extent, the faculty are often reluctant about quote unquote, letting you go because they don't necessarily trust the people you're going to, that they're going to, that you're going to come back, or that you you're not you're, that you're going to have a good experience. And sometimes that kind of alumni or other kinds of relationship like that um, kind of lowers the the threshold for allowing uh, students to the the leeway uh, to be able to to do some of that. But I think that people need to have the kind of maximum uh, exposure to what the opportunities are. I don't know how you're going to get it and how they're going to get it, but um, the there are so many opportunities that students need the chance to look and see 
where is the best fit for them? So, you know, a policy recommendation that's been around for 30 years at least, because I remember making it 30 years ago, is to disconnect the support of students from the support of research. Yes. By supporting yes. students on, on training grants and on fellowships. It gives students much more autonomy. It gives uh, them independence from feeling as though they are beholden to their advisor. Um, it, it improves the quality of education because the, the education will be peer reviewed. Uh, when you're being supported entirely on a research grant, your education is not what is being peer reviewed. It's the productivity, it's the work that you're doing. Um, this turns out to be a very challenging recommendation. That's why it has never been adopted in 30 years. Yes. Uh, we keep making it. Yes. It continues, I believe, to be the right policy answer. But for those brilliant students and fellows on this call, if you can think of a way of getting that recommendation moving, uh, you would be making a big contribution to improving the quality of science education. We had, I was on the science board when we had that argument. We were in the middle of that argument about basically disconnecting those things, and I, I, and and um, it did not go well in the sense that people who who felt as though you know they would they would lose something, and I'm like, this is not about you. But the point is, there's another issue too, and I, that I want to raise: the danger of that kind of dependency. That's how you get harassment. That's when you get, that's how you can get uh, abuse within the relationship because people are afraid to report because of that kind of, that connection. So that it's not just about the being able to give the kind of, of freedom as an academic, but it is about being able to have the kind of personal freedom and agency in order to really uh, help to uh, plot your career. Reduce that power dynamic that's- Yes, that's the power important. dynamic is a killer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the degree to which professional societies and departments on their own can offer gap funding, can really sort of create structures so students can be able to enter internships with, um, intellectual property agreements and be able to smooth out a lot of the infrastructure for it, provide, um, you know, uh, those opportunities, um, you know, carve out pathways with, uh, with their alumni. This is also in terms of the institution, I think a great place for the fundraising department to get involved because they have connections to some of the alumni who are in great positions to be able to you know, make those connections and to build in, you know, a different program for students to be able to go and get experience in industry if possible. Yeah, and I'll just put another plug for the, the traineeship model, especially as NSF tends to do it, can incorporate both that source of funding that's separate from the research grant, but also builds in a lot of these professional development, right. cohort uh, benefits, all kinds of things that come with a traineeship that are so much more supportive of the student in their development, not just the research. Yeah, and then there is the thing that when it, when NIH basically decided that they wanted to look at it using something like my IDP, so that you can have much more structure in terms of that, that expected professional development. Absolutely. All right, so Lane, I'm gonna direct this next question to you. It's on, it's on student mental health. So, Let's say that all students were aware of their own mental health concerns and sought help via counseling, presumably on a campus. Are campus resources able to handle that and would it be sustainable? Um, so I know you touch on that in your report a bit about how it goes beyond just the professional services for mental health. So can you can you touch on that question? I think the big the big outcome of the report on mental health, substance use, and well-being in higher education is that the responsibility for student well-being falls beyond the counseling service itself. If faculty, if staff, if the entire climate of a higher education institution are really devoted and centering the student experience, a lot of the challenges that students um, are affected by, it might not result in a student needing to go seek clinical services. 
the goal of, you know, reshaping um, a culture and climate at a university, you know, changing some of these power differentials, making sure that the mentor-mentee relationships are either in good standing or that there are ways to mediate those conflicts, uh, you know, offering other professional outlets, offering training opportunities to get that wide suite of skills that students are interested in. Those are all things that can help, you know, reduce the friction that students might experience. It's not to say that students are going to be happy all the time. That's not what we're seeking. Um, a lot of the, the intellectual challenges might be stressful, but what is the kind of stress that can help um, students achieve the growth that they need? And what sort of stress is really just sort of an added on um, symptom of a system, as we've all pointed out, that was not made to center their experience and their educational growth? And so I think part of it is, you know, how can we make sure students have the tools that they need in order to, um, you know, sort of mitigate the, the normal stressors that might be part of it. And if it does reach to a clinical level, you know, what services are available for students that might be embedded in a graduate education department, if you're a TA or a graduate student instructor you might not want to go to the same student services where you might run into the undergraduates that are in your lab. Um, and in the event that um, the services aren't available on campus, how can the, um, you know, a, you know, a guide or a liaison be in place to help students seek treatment outside of a university? And this can also be complicated um, for students who were on their parents' health insurance up until um, their 26th birthday. A lot of times that is a really critical period where navigating insurance policies can be a challenge and helping students be able to navigate um, some of these issues that um, you know, might, again, seem outside of the scope of education, but really do impact a student's uh, well-being and ability to persist through um, you know, their, their education, it's really important for those things to be in place if, there's, um, if the, the big concern is the well-being of the student. One of the things that I want to emphasize is the need to re remove the stigma of health help seeking behavior and the and really have people understand that it's not some quote unquote personal failure if you need the assistance to be able to get through the, some of this uh, i'm willing to tell you that as a graduate student i went to the health services because i was sick and uh, they could find nothing physically wrong and i ended up with the psychiatrist and um, essentially, I had not processed that the isolation and the microaggressions had basically taken its toll and it was basically expressing itself as physical illness. Um, it wasn't anything that I had done or hadn't done. It was that I just had not really come to understand that the the kind of of um, taking care of myself that needed to be done was not being done. Uh, I had piled on, I'd taken on too much, and it was doing a particularly stressful time historically. It was like the spring that uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of stuff that was going on. And why should we kind of feel as though we have to be the iron people? who basically with, who take who can withstand everything. Uh, once I understood what the issue was, I knew what I needed to do. And that is to occasionally find time to get away from some of this, to drop off some of the things that I was carrying and to really find people with whom I could engage honestly, which is hard when you are a woman of color in that kind of a setting where there are very few people who look like you, who are gonna understand where you're coming from, who are gonna understand uh, what that kind of an experience has meant for you to have gone through that. But I think that the first step is to remove the stigma. Absolutely, second that, Shirley. There's a, a question in the chat about international students. So. What can be done to make it more inclusive for international scholars who are largely ineligible for many of the training grants and fellowships? So I think you could talk about this both in terms of funding and, and changing environments for them. 
I don't know who wants to start on that. Well, I can tell you that until uh, January the 20th, this was a non-starter as an issue uh, for the United States. Um, you know, the, we were living in an environment where raising the possibility of supporting international students on federal funds was just an impossible conversation to have in Washington. Um, we are now in a very different uh, moment. And uh, uh, there are many of us who have been <laughs> arguing for years again um, that uh, we should be supporting international students on federal uh, traineeships and fellowships. Um, the absence of being able to do that makes it almost impossible to move the recommendation of moving um, uh, all students and fellows onto uh, their own independent funding. So I, I, as an immigrant myself, uh, I should probably say as uh, in, in uh, you know, truth and advertising, um, I, I, you know, I think uh, the vitality of American science is dependent upon the, the fact that so many students come to the United States uh, because they think it is the most exciting place to pursue a career in science. And the degree to which we um, inhibit that uh, uh, movement yeah, will be to at our own peril in my view. I, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. That uh, I, I think about the students, the international students who have taught me so much and I have, have really come to understand. Uh, I want to put a caveat on that. And that is not at the expense of US domestic minority students. In many cases, the faculty basically see the international students as being the quote unquote alternative to black and Latinx students. And I, and so, and, and native students. And so I want us to embrace the idea of, of international communities, but, but to carry with it at the same time the need to expand the population of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people. Because the idea of trading off one of the other is I have a problem with that. And yet I see faculty who will say, well, I want this inter these international students from such and such a country because they're going to work much harder. They're going to be in the lab all of the time. They're going to, the and the mythology basically just carries us into places that I, I don't think that we need to go or want to go. I agree with that, surely. And I think that all points back to the, the system of incentives that are driving the entire system. It is not to say that um, you know, with the, the system gets the results that it's intended to. The system isn't broken. The system is getting the results that it was shaped to have. And so I think fundamentally rethinking it's a, it's a bit of a scarcity mindset that people come into this with. It's either one or the other, instead of trying to figure out how to expand the yes. opportunities to really bring in you know, all sorts of people. I think that that positioning, that zero sum game, um, and I, I mean, it's, I'm not trying to say it's not reasonable because the, the funding situation, the decline in public um, funds to our big research institutions, it creates that mentality, but I think there has to be an active pushing back on that in order to really get to the point where we can think about how are we expanding these opportunities and bringing in everyone and sort of growing the pie rather than figuring out how to fight for you know the what we believe that we have because there's so much more available um, if we really are thinking about expanding the the STEM um, research enterprise and you know where where the talent is. You're absolutely right, but I just want to put in a plug for the need to grow the research capacity of historically black colleges and universities and HSIs and minority serving institutions. They often take students that um, elite institutions will not take because the, they don't aren't necessarily coming with the preparation, but they are willing to start with the students wherever they happen to be. And the question is how then to move them to where they could eventually end up. And that is partly could be done through partnerships, but I think in part, it needs to have a much more fulsome investment 
in places that are committed to moving these populations into um, into a position where they can maximally contribute. And that's a plug, I think, for community colleges as well as the, yep. the basis for a lot of, we had this conversation before the this presentation today, but I think um, so many HBCUs and TCUs are to your colleges. And a lot of our community colleges are a place where there's not a lot of investment, but they serve and educate a disproportionate amount of our adult learners, um, individuals from, um, historically marginalized race and ethnic groups. And so there, there, there's a lot out there that we're just not yep. reaching to. Yep, returning women. You know, that's the other, there's a, that's the other group. There are a lot of, of women who are out there who didn't go to college for whatever reason. They started a family or they, or their family didn't necessarily believe in education. Yes, for their girls. There, yes, there are still people who feel like that in terms of higher education. And they get to a point in their lives and they discover, I've got to get more education in order to get into these careers. The community college, you can take a course here, two courses there, et cetera, and then move through the system. So we have a, a question about undergrad research experiences. So many have noted that the publication and presentation of research are transformative opportunities for undergrads and of course graduates. So how can we expand funding and awards for these kinds of initiatives? And maybe we could focus on the undergrad side there since we've had a little bit more emphasis on graduates so far. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, and in fact, it's, it, um, it, the presumption behind the question is based on a lot of research that has been done over the years to show that the earlier one has an opportunity to experience what it is like to do science. This is, we're not talking about uh, laboratory exercises in most science classes. We're talking about actually getting into a research lab and discovering something. There's, there's a, an incredible correlation with, with how early you have that experience and your likelihood to persist in science. So the, the degree to which you can in your various institutions find opportunities, whether they are during the semester or whether they are during summer, or uh, during uh, uh, intercession uh, periods to get students in the lab experiencing what it is like to do an experiment, um, you are more likely that they will be retained in science. So it's a, it's, it's a very, very important thing to do. Um, some institutions are gonna be able to do it much more easily than others. You know, you begin with the with the liberal arts colleges, where uh, almost all of the, the those kinds of institutions are able to have students working in faculty labs uh, because they are small uh, and have relatively small student bodies. It gets harder and harder and harder as you get to bigger and larger institutions with larger student bodies, because. Um, uh, probably the most negative thing you can do is put a student in the lab and have them completely fail. Yeah. Um, so you need to be paying attention when they're in that lab trying to do experiments. So it's, it, I think it, I'd be the first to say uh, there are environments in which this will be quite challenging to do, but the, the, the more you can get students as early as freshman year in a lab, finding out how much fun it is to do an experiment, uh, you're going to increase retention. And that goes hugely in terms of students from underrepresented groups. Yeah. That is often the hook that essentially brings them and keeps them in the field. And I think one of the other, other places if we're, if we're thinking about inclusion and specifically labs that have um, more field work involved with them. It's thinking about inclusion for students with disabilities is making sure and trying to think about the ways that um, we can make sure that we're serving those students as well. It's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge and some logistics, but if we're thinking about inclusivity, I think the push to make sure that students with disabilities are included is something that um, I hope to see more of in the future. You're absolutely right. And you know, we've had an internship program at AAAS called Entry Point for decades now. 
that have identified students with disabilities for internship and um, research, undergraduate research opportunities. And I, and I uh, totally agree with you. That is a wonderful way to basically identify the students and bring them in and keep them in. Well, I want to thank all of you for your expert insights and, and great advice on laying out this field here. And um, hopefully it inspired it. I, I know I'm inspired <laughs> for those in the audience to submit some great policy proposals to JSPG. And I will hand it over to Shaylin to close us out. Gosh, what a fantastic conversation. Let's do a quick test. Audience, put any letter in the chat if you, you're uh, walking away from the session planning on submitting to this call for papers. Just, just I'm, I'm interested in trying to get a sense. Yeah, Nathan, Remya, Alyssa, Anna, Alessandra, Virginia. We've done our job well. Shirley, Shirley, Kate, Lane, thank you so much for joining JSPG this afternoon. It's been such a fascinating conversation and really, really appreciate your time. Folks, thanks so much in the audience for joining us as well. Uh, again, join us next Friday for with Kate's colleague, David Goldston, director of the MIT Washington office uh, and, and others where we'll focus on the endless frontier portion related to climate change and climate action. We'll be joined by David Hart from ITIF. We'll be joined by Tim Frevetta from Duke University, Dreyfus, and, and others. So looking forward to seeing you all next Friday. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much to our panel.